Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's special deep dive video, I want to take you down an internet rabbit hole that led me to the discovery of an obscure and mysterious piece of lost Waterworld media, the interactive online experience known as Waterworld Quest for the Mariner. So, without further ado, let's head to the Internet Archive and load up the Wayback Machine to uncover this all but forgotten piece of Waterworld lore. But a little bit of backstory before we begin this journey. In my previous video, I spotlighted other Waterworld fan projects from across the internet and in particular looked at a few fan-built Waterworld websites. And while I was doing the research on these websites, I had a specific memory of a very old fan-built website I remember exploring and even having email conversations with its creator way back in 2007 while I was still attending college. And so after some digging, I was able to find this website created at the very beginning of the new millennium, that website being The Way to Waterworld, aka www.movie.tripod.com. And like the GeoCity websites, Tripod.com was another web hosting service that pioneered early user-generated content, and visiting this old website is a bit like stepping back in time itself. From the get-go, you can see that the creator, known as Gorax, had a lot of animosity towards the platform he was putting his content on, claiming that much or all of the website was deleted at one point when he attempted to transfer it to TopCities.com. But regardless, it seems that Gorax, even with this setback, continued to work on the site, completing a good chunk of the to-do list posted on the homepage. And exploring the different sections of this website, some of which are dead links, you get to see a lot of the passion and personality that Gorax was putting into his project. In particular, I quite like this section called The Repair Shack, which attempts to use lore to explain some of the plot holes in the film. But the section I found most endearing was this tab called History, which chronicles Gorax's trials and tribulations in creating the website and living with his parents. But one entry that really stood out to me was in May of 2002 when Gorax rejoiced at the fact that he had been linked by another Waterworld site, that being the site known as Waterworld, the most misunderstood movie of its time. And so when I saw this, I then navigated over to Gorax's links tab and found right at the top a link to this other Waterworld fan site, but clicking on it just redirected me to yahoo.com. This is where the Wayback Machine comes into play. The Wayback Machine is a digital record founded by the Internet Archive in 1996 that allows users to view snapshots of how websites used to look in the past. So, I copied the link from Gorax's list and fed it into the Wayback Machine, which produced this exciting homepage filled with a collage of Waterworld imagery. And check this out, the URL in this snapshot reads waterworldmovie.com, so this domain name was taken over by Lane W and eventually turned into the unofficial fan site in 2014, which I covered in my previous video. And what lay beyond this homepage is an incredibly comprehensive collection of Waterworld knowledge, or as the webmasters of the site Chris and Mike put it, the definitive homepage for the much maligned film Waterworld. Contained within the tabs of this website is at least the acknowledgement of just about every aspect of Waterworld fandom, from the comics and games to the soundtrack and concept art. We can also participate in the site's current poll or sign the guestbook. And check this out, the site even makes reference to the rare promotional tomato plant. Perhaps my favorite section is this tab, Network Comparisons, which compares the theatrical cut to the extended cut that aired in March of 1998 on ABC over two separate nights, a broadcasting event that I was not even aware of. Sadly though, the comparison list dead ends after page one. And yes, I have to say, unfortunately as you can see, many of the images and links are lost or dead even when viewing the site through the Wayback Machine. 
and this will be a bit of an ongoing occurrence as we descend deeper into this rabbit hole. But regardless, the next step in our journey is to take a look over in the site's links tab, and here we can find that link back to the way to Waterworld that Gorax was so excited about scoring, and check out this, here is a link to the Mariner's Trimoran, that GeoCity site that I covered in my previous video on Waterworld fan projects. And yeah, I just think it's really cool how all these old fan sites would link off to each other, there's just a very tight feeling fan community here. But as we come to the bottom of the links page, we encounter this. A strange looking button with the words Waterworld, Quest for the Mariner, an interactive online experience. And staring at this for the first time, my jaw completely dropped because I instantly knew what I had found. So before we step forward and see what's behind this mysterious door, I would just like to go back about a year before I discovered this link. In the comments section of my latest channel update video, channel update number 3, YouTuber Leprechaun Productions left me a curious message talking about an online Waterworld tie-in game that they remember from the 1990s that had live action cutscenes and where you played as a nameless drifter visiting various locations from the film. And to be honest, when I read this comment from Leprechaun Productions, I totally thought they were trolling me, especially because there seemed to be zero information about a Waterworld online game when I searched Google, but staring at this link at the bottom of this old fan website, I knew that this must be the lost game and that I had found a pathway back to it. And so I clicked the button and... The link was dead. And I should have not been surprised, the text under the link says as much, but I was not deterred. I copied the link and fed it back into the Wayback Machine search bar, and lo and behold, I arrived at the homepage of Waterworld, Quest for the Mariner. On the homepage, we have this great animated GIF at the top, and below is a link where we can begin the game, as well as two dialog boxes where we can enter a password to access a more advanced place in the game. And at this point, you may be asking yourself, why in the world does this even exist? Especially because, as we can see at the bottom of the screen here, it was published in 1996, a year after the film's release. Well, the answer lies right in plain sight. This was an early, and probably for its time quite novel, piece of viral internet marketing for the live-action stunt show at Universal Studios Hollywood, known as Waterworld, a live sea war spectacular. And yeah, clicking on this link here does take us to a page telling us all about the newly constructed theme park attraction. And as you can see, the page is missing some kind of background texture, rendering the text nearly impossible to read. But for now, let's go back to the game's homepage and start at the beginning by pressing The Adventure Begins. On the next screen, we are given the hero image for the game and the premise for Waterworld that the Earth has drowned with the melting of the polar ice caps. And very curiously, we are informed that we are the lucky ones, the ones that have found dry land. So right away, we can see that the game is in fact a continuation of the film's story, taking place after the events of the movie, but as we'll learn, before the events of the stunt show. We also are told within just the first few sentences that the people of Dry Land have a problem on their hands, and it's very similar to the problem they are encountering back at the Atoll, a lack of genetic diversity. Yeah, I suppose this is a bleak reality for any small isolated society, but I still was kind of blown away that this is the catalyst for the game's story, which I believe is aimed at a younger audience, but regardless, we are told that the Mariner has ventured out on the endless seas to find the rest of the surviving Atollers and bring them back to dry land to help repopulate civilization. But concerns have brewed among the people of dry land as much time has passed without any word or signal from the Mariner and they fear he has crossed paths with the Smokers again. And now it's up to us, humanity's last hope, to venture out on the ocean and find the Mariner and bring back the Atollers. Continuing our journey to the next page, we double check our gear and prepare to depart dry land, but before doing so, we first stop at the thatched hut where the holy man known as Sage resides. 
And if that name sounds familiar, you would be right because if you'll remember back to my deep dive on the stunt show, the third mic'd character that was introduced to the show in 2014 by the company Action Horizons is in fact named Sage. So how crazy is that the lore contained within this lost internet game actually has a direct influence on the most current iteration of the stunt show that's still running to this day. But regardless, Sage, seemingly deep in meditation, acknowledges us entering the hut without even opening his eyes. He gives us seven coins to help us on our quest, which are displayed in the image at the top of the screen. Sage instructs us to use the message in the bottle coin to learn more about the nature of the other coins and, pressing the plain text link here at the bottom of the page, takes us to this other page which gives us a rundown of what the coins are used for as well as some technical specifications about the background sounds, the animations, and the option to preload the game's elements. More on that in just a few moments. Going back to the previous page, Sage sets us on our way and wishes that the provider may aid us in our mission. Moving forward to the next page, we arrive at a familiar sight, an image of the Barter Outpost through an old telescope lens, though here it's called the buoy. We are told that it's only been one day into our journey when we stumble upon the uninhabited buoy, but still, we lower our sails and proceed with caution. Our senses serve us well as out of the mist, two smoker jet skis ambush us and we need to think fast. And this is where we get to start making some decisions because as we'll see, this section of Quest for the Mariner is basically a choose your own adventure story. And at the bottom of the screen, we are given three choices. Fight by using our harpoon, run by launching our kite sail, or drop anchor and talk. So at this point, I think I'll just sort of summarize the branching paths that extend from here. If we choose to fight, we are quickly overwhelmed by the smokers and can either anchor and talk, reverting us back to one of the choices on the previous page, or abandon ship, which will lead us to a watery grave, or to scaling up a rope to one of the buoy's catwalks. If we choose to run and launch the kite sails, the smokers throw Molotov cocktails at our boat, forcing us to become captured, which brings us to the buoy where we can choose to bribe or attack the smoker lieutenant. And finally, if we choose to drop anchor and talk with the smokers, well, this choice actually just gets us to the fighting or bribing of the smoker lieutenant, but with far less clicks. But regardless, all of the choices generally will lead us to finding ourselves alone in the interior of the buoy. And at this point, if it's not already apparent, you can see that many of the photographs used in the quest for the Mariner were taken in and around the stunt show arena. And the buoy's interior is clearly the front entrance of the arena that guests walk through on their way to the stadium seating. And look at this, it's the Mariner's urine purifying machine. Apparently he's been here and we must be on the right path. And in the corner of the room, we spot a cluttered desk. Inspecting it closer, we find a weathered map, which seems to indicate the locations of other fortresses, but all the words have been encrypted in smoker code. Mysteriously, we hear Sage's voice. Decipher the code and you shall find the Mariner. No time to decipher now though, smokers are approaching and we need to make our escape. But before we exit through the trap door in the room, we notice a barrel of what the game calls go-go juice, I guess an off-brand version of go juice. But regardless, we investigate the barrels closer and find a wind-up detonator armed with a small charge. We set the detonator for two minutes and finally make our escape through the trap door. Below the trapdoor is an abandoned water bike which we jump on and speed away. And seconds later, a terrific explosion destroys the buoy. But no time to enjoy the spectacle, we must continue forward to the smoker stronghold. The next page marks the start of chapter 2 of the story where we can check our map again or move on to the stronghold which takes us to the gates outside of the fortress which undeniably look a lot like the gates of the atoll, but in any case, a watch guard, mistaking us for a smoker because of the water bike we've arrived on, shouts down to us, What's the password? And not in smoker code. I want it in English. It's time to consult our map again. 
Taking a closer look, it seems reasonable to assume what most of the words are on the map. For instance, we know that this structure is called the buoy, and obviously these words are the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. And I think it's also safe to assume that this location down here is labeled with the word atoll. So with all of this in mind, it's easy to match the letters and decode the words and quotations in the center of the map, which read, no rest. So, with great anticipation, we go back to the gates of the Smoker Stronghold and enter N-O-R-E-S-T, press reply, and are brought to an internal server error page. So yeah, I'll be straight up with you guys, this is sort of where the game ends, and it was certainly a disappointing wall to hit, but I didn't want to give up on this discovery. So what comes next is a bit of a forensic investigation into what happened to the rest of the game, and a hunt to see if anything still exists. So my first thought when arriving at this error page and seeing no way around it, was actually to go back and probe more around that message in a bottle page that we visited earlier that had some technical information about playing the game. And you will recall that that page talked about preloading game elements. So what this is actually referring to is a special web page that allows players to save the majority of the game's multimedia content to their web browser's cache. And this would allow players to have a more CD-ROM-like experience with images and sound appearing quote in real time, rather than waiting easily 20 seconds for each one to load in on what at the time was very slow dial-up internet. And this really reminds us of what a primitive era of the internet that the quest for the Mariner existed on because even with this special feature, this experience still seemed like it was pretty irksome with this whole section on troubleshooting specific web browsers and web configuration issues. But regardless, by pressing this link under for Netscape users, we get to this page that loads in the game's images. Unfortunately, as you can see, some of the images will not load in, but by right-clicking on the images that do, allows us to save them to our computer's hard drive, and yeah, some of these images are definitely from the later parts of the game, giving us a glimpse of the adventure apparently ahead of us, but of course without any pros to give their context within the story. And around this time too, I discovered that the Wayback Machine has a feature that allows us to compile all the captures with a certain URL prefix into a list, and this really allowed me to see how much of the game was actually archived, a total of 173 pages. And that sounds like a lot, but as you start to take a closer look, that number whittles down quite a bit because a lot of these captures are just the individual pages that house the preloaded graphics, or more annoyingly, pages that won't load and just redirect us to universalmusic.com. But after parsing through this list, I was able to grab some additional pages that I wasn't able to access while clicking through the actual game, most notably the pages that would come sequentially right after entering the password with the gates either staying shut or opening depending on if we entered the correct text or not. And check out this page with the gates opening. It describes entering a maze, and that in the distance we see a crow's nest, very much like what we saw on the map earlier. And the game asks, which path leads to the nest? But of course, clicking on this link leads us to another internal server error page, but check out the URL it's trying to direct us to, something called new maze. Let's keep that in mind for later. But after a couple of days of poking around the Wayback Machine, I was really no closer to seeing the second two-thirds of the game. However, in my digging, I did come across a credits page with all of the creatives that worked on the project. There was no other choice, I had to reach out to the very people that created this game to see if I could salvage any more of the missing story. Now, tracking down the individuals that worked on this project across various websites and social media platforms sort of became its own series of rabbit holes which I of course will not go into detail about here, but lucky for us, a few did reply, including Kevin Davis who was the creative director on the project. 
Kevin was incredibly generous with his time, and when I asked him about the missing chapters of the game, he actually shared with me all the files he still had from the production of the game. These documents include everything from concept proposals to bug reports. And indeed, we can get quite a bit of information from these documents about the lost chapters in the game. One of the most useful documents is this one titled Proof of Concept, which has a bunch of great information about the overall objectives of the project as an advertising tool, but then goes into a lot more detail about Chapter 2, claiming that it would be a first-person perspective maze that will appear as an extensive series of corridors through floating metal barriers that eventually bring us closer to the crow's nest, which was hinted at earlier. This would be accomplished by creating a series of graphics that could be combined in various ways to create the illusion of moving through 3D space. This approach would also allow for the elements to be recombined in new ways, either through a randomizer or scheduled website maintenance, to increase the replayability of the game and encourage multiple playthroughs. As for the third chapter, this document titled Objective of Each Chapter holds some pretty tantalizing information as well, even mentioning that Sage himself is a mutant with telekinetic powers and astral projective abilities, confirming that the Mariner is not the only mutant in Waterworld. How about that for some added lore? But regardless, this document reveals that the third chapter would greatly follow the events seen in the actual live stunt show with more choose-your-own-adventure gameplay, having us discover Helen and the Mariner at the Atoll and fight the Deacon. Curiously, though, it gives three possible endings to the game, one of which has the Mariner acting selfishly and leaving the Atollers to fend for themselves, which actually is sort of fitting when we consider Kevin Costner's depiction of the character in the film. There's also a ton more information to sort through in all of these documents, but a couple of other interesting papers include this scope of concept, which describes a more click and point adventure using panoramic images with embedded links. There's also this document calling the project Waterworld, the Interattraction, a play on the word internet, I'm guessing, which describes character animations after each decision made in the game, and an award system with the in-universe currency of chits, which would allow players to buy prizes like the ability to download quick-time videos of the live stunt show and store them in their treasure chest. It even claims that this would help players savor, rather than resent, the video's long download times because of its award status. And around this time, I got another reply from someone else who worked on Quest for the Mariner, Jake Carvey, who worked on graphics and writing for the project. And Jake seems like he'd be a really fun guy to hang out with and could tell you stories for days about his experiences in the entertainment and animation industry. But when I asked Jake about working on the project, he told me in pretty straightforward terms that the job was quite difficult, mostly due to the limitations of the internet in 1996. Jake told me that their initial dreams for the game would have really required broadband internet to be successful, which would not become mainstream until the mid-2000s. He told me that even small things like the transparency on these GIF images required the team to write their own code. He even told me a funny story about this image, which I recovered with the Wayback Machine, which was so troublesome that the 8-bit file name EW7SKI became synonymous with the term fouled up beyond all repair even after the team stopped working on the game. And finally, I asked Jake about the missing chapters in the game, and he delivered this news, that he did not think that the chapters were ever made available to the public, and now reflecting on this, it starts to make sense. Looking back to Waterworld, the most misunderstood movie of its time, the website that I originally found the link on, it did have this write-up that mentioned that the game ends after chapter 1 because the links are broken, or never existed. And the YouTuber Leprechaun Productions that left me the comment about their memory also mentioned that they were never able to get past the part where you entered the smoker password. And looking at Kevin Davis's documents, the section on the maze in this bug report is a little foreboding, simply asking when will the maze be completed? 
And when I go back and look at the preloaded images from the site, it does seem to be missing any kind of images that indicate corridors of the maze, only giving us images that I believe are the dead ends of the maze section. A site that's kind of poetic in its own way. However, I did reach back out to Kevin about the possibility of never publishing the second and third chapters, to which he replied that it was possible, but he remembered Kawasaki doing a sponsored contest that required people to complete the game to register for the giveaway. And I have to say that while I was going through the list of archived pages on the Wayback Machine, I did in fact come across a few Kawasaki sponsored pages, including this list of contest winners. And as I was finishing writing the script, two more people replied to my call for help. Tom Savola, the technical director on the project, replied to me and told me, quote, the full game was playable, and Nick Scottoro, the photographer on the project, told me, quote, that it was up on the MCA Universal site for a long time. And so this got me thinking, what if I tried to find another path to the game through an old iteration of the Universal Studios website? And I'll spare you all the details here, but this did lead me to finding this page. And as you can see, the game has some very specific browser and hardware recommendations, making me wonder if this is why the game was so poorly preserved on the Internet Archive. But the description of the game on this page also makes me feel more confident that the entire game was playable at some point in time. But regardless, the link to the game from this page actually brought me to a fresh set of archived captures using a different URL prefix, this one reading universalstudios.com rather than mca.com. And this new prefix in reality has less captures, but the preloaded graphics page actually reveals some new images, most notably more images of the crow's nest, Helen beating up some smokers on the Atoll jetty, and this hilarious image of the mariner stuck in a tiny net, which I knew instantly needed to be the thumbnail for this video because at this point in the research, I was feeling a bit like I was stuck in a tiny net. And even as I'm literally finishing editing this video, Jonathan Gortenstein, the writer on Quest for the Mariner, replied to my email and mentioned that maybe the full script is still saved somewhere on an old zip disk, which I believe Tom referred to as well. But Jonathan felt that the maze in Chapter 2 actually had players lost at sea in a storm and used Zork-style text-based gameplay, which doesn't really align with anything we've seen up until this point, but I guess adds a further wrinkle to the hazy recollection around this game. He also mentioned that the game doesn't have three, but five possible endings that the player could receive. So, after many hours of research and reaching out to as many people as I could, I still don't know definitively what the last two chapters look like or the complete story that they told, especially the maze section which is a total black hole, and whether an offline version or the source code for the game still exists on some old Universal Studios hard drive or floppy disk, well, we may never know. But I think it goes without saying that if you're watching this and you have any memories or more information about the game, please let us know in the comments below. However, Jake Carvey did tell me that almost the entire team would work again together to create Jurassic Park The Ride Online Adventure, which lo and behold uses the maze concepts dreamt up for Waterworld and actually sees them to a fully realized potential, which has been much better preserved by the Jurassic Park fan community. And on a human level, Jake also told me that the mid-90s were an exciting time to be getting involved with internet marketing, and that for the people that worked on Quest for the Mariner, it was really a project that kicked off many careers and in a way predicted viral internet marketing with its ambition and scope. A huge thanks to Kevin Davis, Jake Carvey, Tom Savola, and Nick Scottero for hearing my call and helping me put together this video. But there you have it, that is my investigation into Waterworld, Quest for the Mariner. 
I hope that even with the obstructed discovery of the game as a whole, that this story, the journey down this rabbit hole, was still of interest to you. I know that for me, looking at all of these old websites and half-remembered endeavors, it gave me a new perspective on my own work, my place within this small niche fandom, and the possible impermanence of all of our efforts, even here on the internet. So with all of that in mind, links in the description if you want a quest for the Mariner yourself. So yeah, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and say hello in the comments. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We're just about to break 2,000 subscribers and I'd be so grateful if we could surpass this benchmark before the end of 2022. Also, follow the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll. The coins will help you on your quest.